I asked and people wanted it, so here it is. A lore and reference review of everything you might have missed in Final Fantasy XIV's 6.5 patch. All the little details I could find, be they in-game nods or, as happens a lot sometimes, a reference to an earlier Final Fantasy. I'm going to be mashing all of this up with the general opinion sort of video I did for 6.4 too. I'll say how I feel about all of it, but given I plan to do some fuller videos on the things we learned in this, I'll be light on some stuff. Don't treat this as a story summary, because I'll be skipping a lot of that, but do expect spoilers. If you like this, do YouTube things with likes and subscribes, and let's get to it. To start with, the MSQ. My general feeling, by the way, fairly predictable, played straight down the middle, but big points to a strong execution. In the first cutscene, there's a line that might be conditional based on a quest, but I couldn't confirm. Yishtola mentions that Graha met with Noah, which I believe she might only say if you've done Eureka Orthos, since that's when they actually met. The description of how Zero got to go with us to the first had me side-eyeing it a bit when it actually happened. I didn't quite buy it, but now that I'm writing this script, I don't really have any complaints. It checks out well enough. When we get to the first, Becklog is already exasperated at our bullshit, but does mention Unu Kalhai, the first of a generally surprising amount of Void Quest mentions. Yoshi B told us in an early interview for 6.5 to complete the Eden and Warring Triad before doing 6.5. Funnily enough, I don't think there's any Warring Triad mentions, but that might have been breadcrumbs towards the Void Quest without being too specific. The scene where we meet up with Reen is a bit of a partner to that, actually. It's so tied to the stuff with the empty that I genuinely don't know how it reads to people who haven't done Eden. Of course, the nastiness about the Crystal Tower plan is basically identical to the Tower of Babel situation last patch. Credit to Zero showing her growth by immediately recognizing what needs to be done, and credit to the writers for realizing we didn't need it spelled out to us. All my lore notes around Yulmore are related to side things. When we visit the Beehive, Zero thinks pole dancing might be derived from spear fighting, which I'll grant sounds legit, but I checked and unfortunately this isn't true. Down in the Derelicts, Reen mentions that there's been reconstruction going on, and you know what? Now that someone's mentioned it, yeah, I want a Yulmore reconstruction more than I want a Garlemald reconstruction. If that leads to a housing zone, even better, I can't think of a better neighbourhood for all the nightclub venues. Also, I've heard there's a Gaia mention here if you've completed Eden and talked to Reen somewhere, but I couldn't capture it. Oh, and yes, the guy that turns up to thank Reen was a random, nameless NPC from the Siege on Yulmore. Then, we hit up Slitherbow, where we get a lot of very small world-building touches about the Knights Blessed. I'm not sure how much of this was pre-existing and how much is new, but it's all good. Their customs stem from religious faith and that they still hold to them as a symbol of cultural identification, even if the initial reason is no longer relevant. It's also interesting to see that for all that Zero is working to understand how people work, traditional customs of faith definitely still elude her. There isn't even a veneer of the practicality to it for her to latch onto. Over an Armorang, and hello, Maud Sook, and hello, the Trolley Boys. Not much to say there, they're from the parts of the story you think they are. Over at the Wall of Crystal, Zero's look at her reflection is a fairly subtle nod, at least for this questline, to the Mount Ordeals events that turned Cecil from a Dark Knight into a Paladin in Final Fantasy IV. It uh, doesn't work so great for Zero when she tries it. Oh well. Points for effort, but this must look very stupid to the Warrior of Light. But it's at this point in the story, with getting the ether from the wall to the Crystal Tower and then the 13th, that I realised I don't quite buy the in-universe scientific logic behind this plan. I accept it, but it doesn't quite feel like the logic they follow existed before they set it. And that's a bit of a problem with this patch's MSQ as a whole, it's not exactly bullshit, but it fails to completely sell itself to me. Back in the source, we somehow get Yishtola Zero and Yishtola Runa shipping material in two adjacent text boxes, and then it's right up to the moon to punch a hole in all that darkness, bringing us to our dungeon, the Lunar Subterrain. This was the final dungeon of Final Fantasy IV, and was actually my bet as to what the final ending of Endwalker was going to be. Do 
Or do you think I can get a late claim on that win if it happened in 6.5 and not 6.0? Anyway, the geography of this first area is clearly patterned on that 4 dungeon, as is one of the enemies. The Void Moon Plague was an optional boss in the subterrain. Perhaps our first clue to the real aims of the dungeon, though, is the music. That's not the Lunar Subterrains theme. The first boss, the Dark Elf, was also a boss from 4, but not from the subterrain. In 4, he was a pretty plain boss at the end of a dungeon, where the gimmick was that you couldn't use metal equipment. He doesn't fight anything like his 4 counterpart. But, according to the duty support lines, his trick of making his staves invisible didn't work on Yashola, so she just thought he was bluffing. That's fun. But then, we hit the big twist, going into the real Golbaze's memory through his crystal. Say hello to the Kingdom of Baron, the real source of that theme. I initially speculated this might be where Golbaze and Durante went after the Zero meeting in 6.4's flashback. It was the first city in 4, and this section is based on the part of the game surrounding Kang Nyatso's fight after he's revealed as the Imposter King of Baron. The NPC knights in this part of the dungeon are coloured appropriately to their four equivalents. Durante is wielding a Dark Knight skill set, in dual reference to both Golbez's After Years version that he is visually based on, and Cecil's Dark Knight form at the start of 4. Our second boss, the Damsian Antlion, is based on the Antlion boss from 4, indeed fought near the city of Damsian. Honestly, kind of weird how we've never had an Antlion boss before now. In in terms of the final dungeon boss, uh, Durante's combat form is nothing from 4, and honestly, I'm not sure he fits that classical fantasy vibe. He is the first part of the patch that actually surprised me though, and oh, we're back to the sad nod victory. There's already a bit of debate on if the fact we never saw Golbez's face actually means anything, with common theory being that he's an Azem Shard, and they're hiding that because it would either break people's head cannons or somehow spoil it. I honestly don't buy it. The devs don't actually care all that much about people's head cannons, and we know from Ardbird that shards can look like anyone anyway. I think it's more just cost cutting. Golbez isn't a regular human model, they can't just toggle off the helmet to show a face, that'd be a whole new pile of effort that honestly doesn't need to be done if Golbez was just some dude whose face isn't important. There's also speculation his crystal reached out to us because of soul resonance between Azem shards, but honestly, I think the original Golbez was acting in defense of Durante. Most of the dungeon is his fault. Present Golbez's idea of a defense was actually pretty shit. But still, we'd finally meet him, hear his story, and... The Asian Igeom. Wait, that's how you pronounce her name? I've been wrong for years. Anyway, we learn that I've been too harsh on Ardbert. Sorry, my guy, you aren't the biggest idiot in Final Fantasy XIV that I've constantly been describing you as, because holy shit, Durante was such a huge fuck up that I can't imagine any way he could have done this worse. And I'm gonna start calling him Gobies again from now, by the way. So, Fancy cutscene fight. The refight against the four Archfiends at once is one of the few four story integral fights that haven't been tapped for 14. In four, they tagged out rather than all fighting at once. The most interesting part to this cutscene is that Astinian is the one that beats Barbariccia, who in four was a Kane gimmick fight, so that's neat. But with that, we hit the trial the Abyssal Fracture and Zoromus. While their reasons for existing in their respective stories are completely different, including very different driving emotions, 4 Zoromus is really angry, 14 Zoromus is mostly lonely, 14 Zoromus' design is a pretty direct take on 4 design, although it's got some interesting wrinkles in doing that. It's a lot clearer in looking at the 4 sprite design just how hard it's going on the body horror angle with a lot of exposed innards, which doesn't quite come through in the 14 design. Well, until she stabs us with her ribcage, that's pretty gross. In terms of references, the big thing to pull from Zoromus in 4 is his signature attack, Big Bang, and the very spacey background he makes for it, which, sure enough, 14 Zoromus also does. Big Crunch is new, but it's a natural follow-up attack. If you're unfamiliar, the Big Crunch 
is a theory that the universe might end by re-collapsing in a reverse of the Big Bang. It's largely assumed to be wrong these days, but it is a very striking name. The final phase of the Zoromus fight, though, swaps the music from Zoromus' theme to the Red Wings theme, which is generally used as Cecil's theme in 4. Also, as an aside, I think this fight's difficulty sells Zoromus' strength in a way that really works. It's got a similar sort of difficulty to Zodiac, where it uses a lot of different patterns that are hard to process all in a short span, which is a perfect recipe for making a team of complete randos going in blind really struggle. Speaking of, good job Zero on going full force into being Cecil. She's a paladin now. If she ever joins us as a tank in the trust system, it's finally bringing us to the point where we can have an all-female trust party, which is neat. I find it a little surprising Zero isn't coming with us to Dawn Trail, because I sort of assume she was as a permanent cast member, but honestly, we've got a big cast. We can let some of them have time off. And honestly, her story is a bit too singularly focused to make a lot of sense in Dawn Trail anyway. Like, what does she have to do outside of a Void storyline? Golbez's final situation is a reflection of what Golbez did at the end of 4, that was then followed up on in the After Years, by the way. In that final Farewell to Zero, you can mention Unukalhai and Silver if you've done the Void quests, and it's clear that they'd all probably find it very logistically difficult to meet up, but do like that they're not alone. And by the way, after the MSQ wraps, Silver and Unukalhai do have new lines. Similarly, when we get back to the source, if you've done the Omicron quests, Living Way mentions the last dregs and their attempts to expand their business, which are actually the focus of the upcoming Allied Tribe quest that isn't in the game yet. The scenes with the various Scions around this part do generally show a trend of freeing them all up for Dawn Trail. Some of them just have to do some paperwork first. Over in our visit to the first to hand over the Zoromus Crystal, Feo all gets a nod, apparently having relayed the events of the fight to them. Unukalhai also comes up again, and none of that matters because Gaia gets a full voice scene if you've completed Eden. There were so many people asking for Eden to be compulsory for this to happen. It really was not necessary because this is great anyway. If you talk to Gaia after that cutscene, she mentions wanting to visit both Ilmeg and Fake Amarot in the Tempest. Interestingly, she externalizes her description of Logreef and Mitron as those two when talking about Fake Amarot showing pretty clearly that she doesn't see herself as Logreef, if anyone was ever confused. The banquet's a nice ending full of minor NPCs from Rads at Han that I couldn't quite pin down, but the nicest part is Vitra and Ajdaya roaring off to their brethren. If you listen to that scene very carefully, they get two roars in response from Grace Velgar and Tiamat. If you talk to Vidofnia after this, she does confirm that Grace Velgar heard it. Finally, we have the little coders in Shalian. Turns out the reason Kral put that letter as pretty low priority was because it's old as hell. Interesting to note that while we never see the front of Kral's envelope, it is textured and data miners have found that it's addressed to Galuf from Galuf Jaja, the king of Tuli a two-headed mamulja. And that clover earring is honestly a total mystery. I've seen theories, but none hold a convincing amount of evidence for me yet. We'll probably learn at the October Fanfest. Meanwhile, the person Erinville brought is very inconclusive. We can rule out Lalafell and generally assume female, but beyond that, no one can tell. It looks like there's fur on those legs, but it's hard to tell if that's on their skin, in which case, female Hrothgar maybe, or just fur legwear. And before you ask, the data miners checked, and uh, oh, sorry, so yeah, that's the boy questline. Overall, I liked it, didn't love it. I've seen comparisons that the storyline's like one of those quasi-canon anime movies, and I'll agree with that quite affectionately. Golbees is our Broly. Moving on to the 12 raids, which I actually didn't like, but mostly for gameplay reasons rather than story. I think they're too easy, and for the concept they're working with, that's the problem. But to the lore. First of all, you've got brief meetings with all the gods that we've met thus far. I won't summarize all of them, but they do recognize if they're your patron deity, and Biogot recognizes if you're big into crafting. After that point, it becomes a line of confirming things that people have already speculated about. 
first, it becomes pretty clear pretty fast that they're basically trying to commit suicide through fighting us, even if the why isn't especially clear. Second, that the unnamed 13th is the Watcher, meaning that, like him, the 12 are all recreations of ancients from Vanar's group. It's just that they've been shaped beyond that by 12,000 years of prayer, while the Watcher's remained essentially in the form he was made as because he's too unknown to be influenced in that way. And third, yep, Derek is Ostjan. I also like that you're allowed to incorrectly guess the other leading theory, that the Oppo Oppo is Ostjan. I honestly wish it was, because I don't handle sad animals very well, and there's a lot of sad animal here. We also meet the other two of the last three gods, but we'll get to them as we hit them as bosses. The raid is called Thalia. We all predicted that. Thalia is the third of the three graces of Greek myth. Thalia was also one of the nine muses, completely separately, because what we know as a singular Greek mythology was actually just a stack of overlapping local religions with similar figures. First area, the Heaven of Water. Depicted by the astrologian card the Ewa, which just describes a mighty river. Here we see a city floating on it, with visual cues taken from both Charlian, who worshipped Thaliac, including the Charlian symbol being on some buildings, and the city of Nim, who worship... Ostjon, actually. Seems in poor taste to have those Tomberry statues, given what happened to them. You can see the Ewa card actually depicted on the wall as a mural. Fitting, since our Astrologian deck is Charlian. First enemies are a bunch of sea serpents. It's hard to tell if they intentionally resemble the Nepto Dragon, the famous legendary fish from where we born, or if it's just that there's only so many fish enemies. The first real boss though, Thaliac. His design is sort of a combination of his depiction on the Ewa card and his statue in Old Charlian. Maybe because the card's design had a lot of aesthetic overlap with Ostron. His combat techniques derive from both him being a scholar and a god of water. A lot of math and geometry based spells, but also big old tidal waves. Our next stop is the Heaven of Wind, depicted on the arrow. While the Heaven of Wind was only ever depicted as a peak, this adds the surrounding ocean for the sake of Limlane. She's actually the goddess of navigation and sailing, so there's a wind and air crossover there. Her design is original, but you can see her dress has influence of the Lominson depictions that treat her as a mermaid, and of course, the fish's spear. The big law beat in her fight is summoning Perikos and Thalios, the twin sea serpents under her command. The big skeleton in Upper Lenorcia has baseless myth that it's Thalios, and there's both a little Thalios and little Perikos that you can catch near Costa del Sol. And finally, of course, Ostron. His appearance is based on his depiction on the arrow, and, well, he's just an archer with very fancy archer tricks. His whole thing was being the Wanderer, and that was more depicted in Derek than in his deific form. And that's it. That's all of them. Except it's not, of course. There's one final climb before we fight all of them, fused together for one last fight. Eulogia, aka Eden's promise on crack, testing you on remembering every single boss's mechanics. Or, honestly, maybe Eden's promise on sedatives. I actually found this significantly easier than I ever found Eden's promise. I think some of its attack combos actually make avoiding them easier than they were in their original fights, not harder. Eulogia, by the way, obviously is a root word of eulogy, which fits them wanting to die, but Literally, it's a Greek word for blessing, which also fits how they essentially see the world and what they want to leave it with. And so, they do. With one last comment, they all pass on. Well, almost. Because it turns out that like me, Ostron also can't resist a sad animal. So, part of his life returns as Derek, while everything else, all the other gods, pass on to the live stream. I've seen people a little confused by that, the notion of if they were creations as described, that surely they wouldn't have a soul to go back there, but I think this is like Alpha. If an arcane creation like Alpha can get a soul after a relatively brief adventure, then it stands to reason that if given 12,000 years, 
the 12 had plenty of opportunities to get one of their own. Before seeing Derek off, we bring the remaining essence of the 12's charges to the Sanctum of the 12, and hear brief grabs about everyone from back when they were ancients. Again, I won't summarise them all, but the ones with interesting notes for references to other things? Biagot worked under Hithlodius, who was a terrible boss, Raga actually did smash a meteor, which we first heard of in Fish Lore. It might have possibly been the one originally containing the Aurasite that Athena found. Althic and Nemeas confirmed that we did indeed meet them in Alpus. Halones doesn't give us much info about her, but does confirm that Pashtaro's seat was focused on law and justice. Menfina figured out how to seal away Zodiac. Thaliac was the headmaster at Academia, and so might have written one of those notes in that dungeon. And Limlane's history also links back to fish lore. I liked that lore stuff, just a bit of a shame that the raid was a real whimper. I think it solved some of my concerns about doing a raid series around the 12 in the first place by the end, but that's a bit overly complicated for this video. And that would be all. Except that we've also got Margrat! We've only had the chance to do the first leg at time of recording, so this is going to be brief, but let's cover it. Theo Paulden explains where he turned up in the Labyrinthos revisit, so I don't have to explain him. Margrat herself, though, also an unnamed NPC in the Labyrinthos revisit, she went completely insane from lack of sleep. She got a reappearance and a name in 6.4, loving her newly freed schedule. But Margrat's story shows the sort of workplace Labyrinthos is. They've completely dropped supporting non-essential amenities, meaning the quality of life sucks so bad that even the seats are unworkable. Turns out Margrat was working on studying the conditions the Ragnarok would have to fly through, which was useful enough to the Ironworks that her team's transition after that entire escapade was pretty smooth. Not everyone was so lucky. Presumably, the rest of the deliveries will introduce us to more of life in the Labyrinthos research teams, but Right now, that's basically all we've got. Well, save that at least one guy really likes cats. And that's all. Next up, I'm going to be doing, well, one hell of a thing on the 12, so that'll be fun. And if you want more of that, keep an eye out. Subscribe, encourage me with YouTube buttons, and I hope to see you again real soon.